So um, this is cluster computing, scaling a fuzzy search. Uh, it's also about how audio verifications work in Biggle. Um, uh, about me, so I am um, Riley Burton. I am the Senior Director of Platform Engineering at Viggle. Um, and Viggle as a company uh, is a mobile app. It's a uh, loyalty platform for television. Uh, it's a social TV thing. Um, the basic idea is that you check into television shows and you get points for watching those television shows. So it's an attention-based currency. And um, you can trade those points in for real things like gift cards and percent off things and other wonderful real world offers. Um, so how it works. So basically, you, you sit at your TV in your living room, and you have a, a, mo a mobile phone. And uh, you tap the button on the phone. We listen to your TV for uh, some number of seconds to determine what you're watching. Um, you then sit and watch intently. And then apparently, you dance around and take your pants off. I don't know who made this slide or, or why that is part of the marketing message. But you, apparently, you dance around and take your pants off after you check in. It's great. Right. <clears throat> um, so th the main entry point to the app is um, audio verification. It is how you check into a show. As opposed to other apps that let you just sort of tell what you're doing, what you're checking into. So Foursquare uses GPS locations. Um, this uses ACR, right, to tell what you're watching. Um, the check-in process is based on recording a 10-second print doing signal processing on that print, and producing a fingerprint that looks like that. It's a string of numbers. Um, the, 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 so the fingerprint itself, and I'm sorry, I have to kind of get a little bit technical here to go over this, because it gives you context for how the search works and, works and why it works the way it does. Um, so it's based on spectral flux and frequency bands. right? So we have um, a set of bands. There are 24 of them. <clears throat> that uh, we compute differences in amplitude across those frequency bands, all 24, uh, across time in really small windows, right? And this gives us an idea of how, how much the signal is changing uh, as we go in time. And uh, these sort of eight millisecond chunks end up being unique enough when we just compare louder or softer, louder or softer, louder or softer, that we end up with a 24-bit print that represents that little 8 millisecond slice of time. So it sort of looks like this. We take an audio signal. We make an, a fairly wide FFT on that audio signal. It's about a quarter second. Um, we then take this FFT area, move it, and do it again. And then we move it, and do it again, et cetera, and, and so on. Um, we use the frequency spectrum from about 150 hertz to about 4,000 4, hertz. Um, 150 was chosen because the frequency response of iPhone's microphone actually gets really bad under 150 hertz. So it can't really hear stuff down that low. And um, 4 kilohertz, because we wanted to keep it to uh, GSM, you know, uh, vocal range. Um, OK, so the fingerprints uh, end up, after this process, as a 3,000-bit string. Right? It's represented in JSON as 24-bit integers. There's 125 of them. We have a 3,000-bit string. Um, each fingerprint in our system is one second of audio. Uh, and there are no two that are exactly alike. Um, this is because we are in the business of finding exactly what you're watching, not uh, what you may be watching similar to or you know, other performances that have similar sound qualities. We want to know exactly what you're watching, and therefore the print needs to be unique. Um, but the problem with it is that it's so unique that you need sort of a, a wide variance to deal with background noise and echo and microphone and distance from the TV and people talking in the background to still be able to find the piece of audio that the user is recording on their phone. So uh, the requirements to actually search this fingerprint, now that we have it, this big 3,000-bit thing, in order to find it, we have to uh, do a search where as many as 1,000 bits can differ uh, 
against a matching print and the database print. A thousand bits can still be wrong and we still consider it a match. And this is very difficult because those thousand bits can differ in any position. So doing a search on that uh, is sort of a brute force problem and it's ugly and it is no fun and I do not like it. Uh, but so we have to do this extremely fast because we're sort of in a real time check-in business, right? So we have to be able to tell people, you are watching American Idol and you're watching it you know, in a second. We know what you're doing. So overall, and is Brian's in here, right? This credit goes to this slide for Brian Donovan in the back there. Yes, this is his creation. Uh, this is sort of the a snapshot view of the system as a whole. Uh, all these services, the, the point of this is to show you that all these services are um, Java services which speak JSON over HTTP, uh, an early design decision, which I think is a great one. Um, we have a set of back-end services like t television information, events processing, ledger, things like that, that uh, are fundamentally I.O. bound, so they do a lot of database transactions and looking up of things. And, uh, so the, I'm here to, so the area that I'm here to talk about is the rainbow and unicorn that, that I guess t until now has been a mystery to the Omni team about how the audio verification system actually works. So uh, the point of this is that early on, uh, when I first designed the first cut of how we're going to do audio verifications, I tried to remain faithful to the design of the overall backend systems, which are Java services, JSON over HTTP on purpose. Because it's a good idea uh, when you're designing systems to have a homogenous sort of set of services that all look the same when you challenge them, they all behave the same way. All the developers know what they're doing. So how the query works uh, is we have to make some assumptions. We can't do a brute force search on 3,000 bits across trillions of bits in the database because we'll be sitting there for weeks while it processes through and shifts and processes through to find the, the print. So what we have to do is we have to make some assumptions. And the assumption, the fundamental assumption we make is that 24 bits or one 8 millisecond frequency band, set of frequency bands, sorry, is going to survive from the recording process on the phone unmolested. That means it's actually 16 milliseconds because we're doing flux, right? So we're comparing a window to another window. We need to know that, we, we need to assume, sorry, that um, that eight millisecond slice has made it because if we don't, it's disaster. So uh, this is the way the search works. We make a giant, in, it's not even that big, but in memory 24 bit hash table, right? Those hash table 24 bit every location unsigned match up to a list of every possible program in, in RAM that this integer might appear and the position in that program that that integer appears. So when we go to do a search, we can sort of limit our search space to just the places where this print might actually match. And so we don't have to search the whole universe of bits. We only have to search the universe of bits that had this little section survive, right? Um, so we do look up. We then uh, do a look up to a hash table, find the location in RAM, quick XOR of the bits, right? This gives us a result. We then do a pop count on that result, figure out how many bits are different. If they fall under the threshold and they have a certain weight, we have a match and we can stop searching. Uh, the only problem with this is we still have problems where you can have 3,000 bits and you can have every third bit be wrong and it's still a match, meaning a 24-bit section did not survive unmolested. And this becomes the ugliest part of the search because now we still want to try to find this. We still want to try to give the user a good experience. But as we start to flip bits in these, in these integers, we you know, make our search space exponentially larger because we're making permutations. And as a result, it gets very, very, very bogged down doing this. So the, the, the bit flip process is take, a, take an integer, flip it, flip a bit, uh, get a new sort of candidate integer to search to, to, as a starting location, do a lookup in a hash table, find American Idol, do the XOR, get a bit difference, and now you have a, hopefully, a match, and you can stop. Um, so I said this a little bit earlier, but the initial design goals of the first cut of this were to do 
a, a Java service which would speak JSON over HTTP, uh, and it would use JMS to distribute the prints around to the machines that actually did all this math. Uh, and, and it was clear early on that it's, it's so many prints that it couldn't be done uh, in monolithic copies of the machines. We had to partition this data because it's just too, too, much, too much computations. So early on, uh, we needed something that would allow us to take an incoming query, parallelize it, and send out the query to multiple places, and then get an answer. So what's required in general to do live TV audio matching is you need something that's going to make fingerprints, right, of every live stream. So we have this currently DirecTV installation where we uh, pull IPTV, uh, it's MPEG-TS, and we pull out the audio program stream, right? And then we fingerprint this in real time by running it through these FFT processes, and that spits out Presumably, it spits out JSON. In, in the actual process, it spits out a binary representation of the fingerprint. We then fire this into EC2, where they are, the prints are ingested in real time into RAM. Uh, and then we have sort of another piece that will split out the query among all the different partitions. And we need a way to sort of, for each partition, be able to run multiple instances of it so we can scale and have high availability, et cetera. So the initial cut of this used JMS to get prints in. It had a bunch of sort of identical nodes that were Java services. It had a Java service on the front that was a multiplexer that would take JSON and then spit JSON to all the individual, one of the nodes in the area, and that would uh, perform the search, eventually re return the result. Uh, the important thing here is that it was all JSON and it was all Java, and that was bad for this particular solution. So uh, when we started, we were on Time Warner Cable. We did 148 channels. We did this with six physical servers to make fingerprints. Um, it's a pretty CPU-intensive process is doing all these FFTs and making fingerprints. So uh, it, it wasn't sort of ideal to do the print creation and the search on the same machine. It was just too much, too much work. Um, so the, they would actually uh, create a fingerprint as JSON, fire it as an HTTP post to a, a set of machines in uh, EC2, which would then take this and drop it on a JMS bus, right, as a text message. Just drop it on, and it would get distributed out to whoever cared. Um, so the machines that actually did the matching would read from the JMS bus, right? Uh, they would ignore those prints that didn't apply to their partition. Um, they would place these prints into RAM, they would also handle requests for queries of these things at the same time, and they would send back JSON responses when they answered, and then we had a thing that parallelized this and sent the query to multiple things. Um, so this is all important because of our traffic. So on, on a nightly basis at Viggle, we get giant surges. So our days mostly look like this. This is Circonus. Uh, this is the traffic coming from into the matching infrastructure. And it is, you, you, can't, you can't see by scale here, it's not that quiet, but it's quiet during the day, relatively quiet, right? Relatively quiet and flat and nothing exciting is happening. And then at 8 p.m., we get this because we have a business model that says we want people to check into television shows when they start and we actually incentivize them to do it all at the same time, because they're getting points for how long they're watching something. And by extension, early on, we sort of thought, you know, they'll just check in whenever, and they'll get, you know, 40 points when they check in 20 minutes into an hour show instead of 60, and no one's really going to care about that. But it turns out that's not true. And they do this, and they sort of attack us all at once. And this happens at 8 p.m., and it happens at 9 p.m., and it happens at 10 p.m., and it's on. It's, hard, it's a hard thing to, we know when it's coming, which is great, right? We have prime time television spikes. We know when it's going to happen. What we don't know is how big it's going to be, so it's hard to plan for. We uh, have some experience that certain big shows are going to be certain loads, but we don't know when new shows come out how popular they're going to be. You know, if the Emmys is on, is it going to be this huge uh, a 
attack. It's, it's something on during the day when we're not really ready for it that is a big deal, like the Ellen show or something. Right, so, so this happens every day. Um, now, on a busy day, we'll process about one million matching searches, right, at currently. And they're, but the problem with it is that they're cl all clumped together in these five minute windows. So then on June 5th, uh, we had ugly things happen. So this was uh, against the Java matching infrastructure, I believe, at the time. Uh, so what happens here is the, the red line is responses from the match server, and the blue lines are requests coming in from the public API service, which is a Node.js service that just is forwarding the requests on as it gets them, right? So uh, what can happen under Java is many, many bad things. Namely, we get so many, so many requests, we can't process them all, so we stop reading incoming prints from the JMS bus. This, put, this puts pressure back on JMS. I'll get to all that in a second. But there are lots of pain points in the initial design which had to be ironed out or we were never gonna survive. Or we would have survived. We would have spent a million dollars a day on scaling, right? So uh, some of the main problems are uh, high CPU uh, causing slow subscriber problem. I'll, I'll get to that in more detail in a minute. Um, uh, every, so every, tier of this is a JSON message which is pushed over HTTP, just adds a bunch of overhead that we could be use, use, using time to uh, actually process queries and do XORs and do things. But instead, we were spending time parsing stuff we didn't need to. Um, uh, so running in a JVM makes um, assembler optimization of some of this very difficult. I'm, I'm not making the argument that you can't, because you can, you can write JNI that does these very specific low-level things and call into JNI. The problem with that is it makes no guarantee that you're not getting a copy instead of a pointer. And that just adds an extra memory copy to your processing. And when you're doing thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of these a second, that is a, a bit of time you don't need to spend. And the other problem with this is we required so many instances running during peak times that it, it became difficult to manage at all. So we have to fire up, uh, spin up EC2 instances, make sure that they were in the correct load balancers that they needed to be in so that they would get the correct traffic. And this whole management process uh, was a pain in the ass, honestly. So, uh, so slow subscriber problem. Um, this plagued me for a long time. And as a result, I hate JMS. Uh, basically. J the JMS service did, its, did what it's supposed to do, okay? It did its job. It got a message coming in, and it put it out on the topic. And then everyone who's reading the topic was supposed to read it, right? But if everybody slowed down reading that topic, the buildup of, of the heap inside the JMS server would eventually outrun its bounds of either the heap or the machine, depending on how big you made the heap. And then bad things started happening, so uh, it stopped forwarding messages on because it was dropping them on the floor, or it was forwarding messages on, but it was ignoring new ones coming in, and that's bad because what happens is we don't have the prints we need to match against in real time because we're getting, they're getting dropped on the floor. And as a result, we get more traffic because people go to check in and it fails, and then they do it again and it fails and do it because we can't catch up, so we don't get a break in this situation. So it had to be re rewritten, right? So the, the goals of the redesign were to reduce the expense, because it was very expensive to run. We had to get the number of instances that we used to, to do matching down to some manageable level. We wanted to do this in such a way so as to not have to configure anything and have it all figure it out itself, which is great when you have small teams. Um, parsing JSON everywhere is a minor optimization, but it annoyed the crap out of me. Uh, JMS back pressure, we had to chuck JMS. Not that JMS isn't great. It, it, for this particular application, this high speed, real time information flying around, it can't keep up. It just can't do it. Uh, and we had to solve the problem of slow math. Um, we can't get close enough to the, heart, to the hardware, to assembly, to actually speed up these processes running in a JVM. So I turned to academia and 
it, it fundamentally is a cluster computing problem. You basically have a thing, and you want to split up this thing and consume as many possible cores and RAM as you can to solve the thing quickly. Um, and it's a, it's a parallelization problem because we had no, we have to brute force at least sections of this data to find things, right? So we, uh, I, I sort of chased down a, a traditional cluster compute setup, which is traditionally used for running these long sort of calculations that take, you know, hours and days, whatever, to process. So we had to get that down, and I wanted to use this cluster compute to do millisecond things. Right? Would it, would it work? I don't know. Let's find out. So in Java, we have uh, code that looks like this, right? So we have two things that we have to XOR, and uh, we have a bit counter that we build to figure out when we get an XOR, how many bits does this have, and count them all. And then we can d do our math, right? So very, very slow. Even with a lookup table, very, very slow. In C++, we can do cool things, like we can use intrinsics to uh, do the same process in giant chunks, right? So instead of 32-bit chunks, we do it in 128-bit chunks, right? It reduces the operations from 125, 126, whatever, operations to do XORs in the old way in Java down to like 25, right? It's a big 5x speed up in uh, processing time. We also get, on, on good newer hardware, we also get a pop count, hardware pop count instruction to also do very much faster math to count bits, right? So, where am I? Oh, another, another, another strategy here is to use um, spot instances in Amazon. So instead of paying for reserved instances, design things in such a way so as to deal with an instance just going poof suddenly, someone taking it from you, uh, and still be able to go about your day and, and everything's fine, and eventually you'll get a new one and replace it and everything's good. If you don't design for this, it could be ugly, but um, uh, so zero configuration, uh, no instances need to be told anything when they boot. Um, the fixed pieces of infrastructure, which you'll get to, we'll get to in a second, uh, don't, shouldn't have to know anything about who's coming online and who's not and when they go away and when they don't. Uh, and the only configuration in this system right now is their names of the services. That's it. Everything else works itself. Uh, all communication should be binary. That's fairly clear. Uh, so we replace JMS with 0MQ uh, to do all the communication between the cluster nodes. And we end up with something that looks like this. Uh, the fixed pieces of infrastructure are in blue here, uh, and the gray pieces of infrastructure can, sorry, can scale as many as we need, right? So we get jobs that come in as, um, or qu query requests that come in as uh, JSON over HTTP to, uh, it's actually Lighty running a fast CGI process, many of them. Uh, this gets pushed over 0MQ to a job router. And its sole job is to take it and fan it out to every partition. We have to run these queries in parallel because we have no idea in the database of bits where this thing is going to match. So we have to run them all, all the time, which stinks, but it's the way it is. Uh, so the job router fans it out. Some, some to each partition, some machine on each partition takes that job, does its lookups, right? Does its XORs, does its bit counts, gets a result. It doesn't, it pushes it back in an asynchronous way to a sync, and its sole job is to take results and then make them available to the original requester. The original requester eventually pulls it. So the interesting thing about this is that it's all asynchronous. So a job request comes in to a CGI process, right? We simply push it, tell the job router, go do something, and then put, put it on a shelf. And forget about the socket. It just sits there. Meanwhile, in the background, we're reading the results from the sync. When all of the results come back, or if we eventually time out if something terrible goes wrong, we can pull the socket off of the shelf that we put it on and say, hey, here's your answer. But in the meantime, I can process as many sockets as I want in the CGI. I can just keep spinning and keep spinning and spinning forever. That means I can handle all of our load with very, very few actual web servers. And in the old, old world, in the Java world, we needed many, many 
things to do something similar. Um, the other uh, sort of design goal is, was to scale to available dollars. So, so dollars that we spent on this infrastructure were a, were a problem, right? It was a lot of money. And it, it's sort of one of those things where it's a requirement of the application to do this, but it doesn't provide any revenue really to the business. It's just like sort of the barrier to entry to be in this space. We have to provide ACR, but it's a feature that everybody just expects to be in the app and we, we can't actually make any money off of it. It's just something we have to provide. So doing it as cheaply as possible was sort of of paramount importance. So we sort of, I built in this concept of fuzzy, fuzzy reduction. And so in order to do a search, and we went over so sort of bit flipping and fuzzy searching earlier, um, under load, the, the nodes that are actually processing these queries can decide by themselves that they are getting too much work and they need to reduce their fuzziness in order to, to perform matches. Excuse me. I'm out of water. So, uh, as we're so as so, I'm sorry. Um, if we're falling behind in work, right, we can say let's do the same amount of work, but let's not make it so so difficult on ourselves and reduce the number of bit flips. So we're going to reduce the the user's experience if they're in a crappy location where it's really really loud or they have a lot of echo or something's going on where it's gonna be difficult to match anyway. But we have a lot of users, thank you, who, um, who uh, are in a perfectly fine environment and we can find their audio very easily because they have a, a good recording. So let's give them a good experience and give the people who are sort of in a bad environment anyway a bad experience so we don't ruin it for everybody, right? This allows us to scale to available dollars because we can, if we decide one day, let's start giving the users who have trouble checking in and audio verifying a good experience, we can just spend, spin up more machines, spend more money on that particular evening. And as a result, we spread the fuzziness over more cores in the cluster. And as a result, fuzziness is higher in general, right? So we can match more stuff, great. But, uh, so, uh, new design, metrics, uh, so by, by making these changes, by, by switching to a sort of a lower level uh, set of intrinsics to, to do the math, by, by eliminating latency everywhere we could, by getting out of, get, getting rid of JSON and over HTTP everywhere and getting rid of in Java, uh, we were able to reduce, so, so on a nightly basis when we were running at, at full bore, we would have to spin up many hundreds, 300 instances to do all this. And it's extraordinarily expensive. And now we can do it with 50, which still sounds like a lot, but it's a, it's a lot of math. Um, so in the, obviously as, as an extension to this, the web services bill that we get on a monthly basis went from something scary to something from 100 and, what was it? 180,000 down to 25, uh, which is, oh, oh really? Uh, thank you, Gare, for spending that money. Uh, so what, $180,000 down to 25. So, we also were able to increase um, the uh, amount of coverage that we have I I for actual audio to match in RAM from an hour to four hours, right? So now we can cover the entire country. Uh, we'll record something, make fingerprints of something on the East Coast. It's still alive after it goes off the coast of LA or coast of California. Um, you can still check into it. It's still in live RAM somewhere before it eventually expires. Um, we, we were able to take a second search, took about a second on average, down to 300 milliseconds on average to do uh, a search across all the live data. So we're currently doing 170 television stations 
right now in real time. Uh, on Sundays, we do 185 because of NFL football. Uh, the, the, other, the other interesting thing about sort of reducing fuzziness is that the performance of the search actually gets better when we get more load. So during the day, we're very, very fuzzy, and we, we get these searches that come in, and we spend 300 milliseconds searching through our RAM. Eventually, we give up if we, if we can't find it. But when we start to reduce the fuzziness, the bit flip count, um, when we get these huge spikes, right? So now the searches suddenly get an order of magnitude faster. Now we're returning searches in 30 milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, that we were taking 300 milliseconds before. We're still getting a pretty good search result because most of the time people are doing the right thing and not yelling into their phone, but actually pull, you know, trying to listen to the TV. Um, and the, the other nice thing about this is that it's set and forget. So aside from having to maybe spin up some instances if we're behind, uh, it sort of does its thing. It runs itself. It doesn't need to be watched or managed. Of course, we have monitoring and metrics on everything, but there is no configuration to do anything, which is great for somebody like me, because I don't have to run around and do, do things. So I guess lessons from this and, and pro tips is that uh, I guess Break the, break the rules of the sort of system design if it makes sense for a particular solution. So in our world, we had Java, JSON, or HTTP services. Great. But in this particular case, it's specialized enough, and it was hard enough to do in the Java world that it makes sense to break it and then do something more interesting. Um, uh, use, if, if you're doing sort of AWS stuff, I would encourage you to save some money and use spot instances everywhere. Um, make your design such that if someone steals your machine, you're going to survive perfectly fine because you'll end up spending one-tenth the amount of money that you would spend if you're using a reserved instance at, in, in Amazon. So use, use spots if you can. If you have a design that allows it, please do it. Uh, if you, uh, the third lesson to this is if you need to spin up hundreds of instances to solve a problem, something is very, very wrong, and you should stop what you're doing and immediately rewrite it or redesign it and make it way more efficient than it, needs, than it is currently because it gets uh, very expensive. So this concept of flux is interesting. Flux allows us to do not only interesting things with audio, but we can find matching sets of audio based on a, a, a bit pattern, right? It allows us to do interesting things with video as well. So you can take flux in a frequency band, uh, take the difference in amplitude in a frequency band and, and call that flux. You can also take sort of pixels in an image, right? And compare them to pixels in the same location from a previous image, and you can get a flux calculation the same way. And in this way, we can fingerprint video, too. So we can do uh, interesting things. I, w I really wanted to demo this live, this um, video thing. It just didn't all come together at the right time. So you're going to get a screenshot instead. Sorry. We can do uh, sort of computer vision-y cool things like this, where we can find a TV in a, in a, in a scene, uh, grab uh, some frames out of that in, in real time, do flux calculations on that, and find the frame that is happening in real time for live TV uh, in a database. And you can see it on the bottom left is the, is the frame from the, the recording. Uh, the TV in the scene is on the bottom right, and in the middle is the transformation of that to make it square with some bugs in it. But uh, we can find uh, video like this, which is an interesting feature, because now not only can you do audio verification by holding your phone up, but if you're in a noisy or a crappy environment, or the TV's on mute because you don't want to wake up your kids, you can instead hold your phone up like this and grab the screen and match it, which is an interesting um, extension of the same thing. And, then, and the nice thing is, because we've spent a lot of time doing this sort of bit searching infrastructure, this cluster compute that does this bit searching, we can if we can make a video fingerprint that just fits in the same 3,000-bit space, we don't have to do anything else. We're done. 
All we have to do is make a fingerprint and throw it into the infrastructure, and it'll just search for it, which is great. So we get video matching almost for free, which is awesome. Okay, uh, that was a little fast. I apologize. Uh, questions? I'll spend a long time on questions. Yes? How does the sampling rate of the iPhone? Well, the sampling rate of the iPhone is changeable. You can sample everything from 48 kilohertz all the way down to eight. Sorry, the question was, how does the sample rate on the iPhone affect the, the fingerprinting process? So you, you want, um, we want a consistent sample rate everywhere we do this, obviously. We, uh, the recording device itself on both Android and iPhone is, is Flexible, we can. So what we do actually in practice is actually we record at a high rate for high fidelity, and then we uh, sample rate convert down to eight kilohertz, just because it makes the FFT way faster to only have the process eight kilohertz than all this stuff, right? So um, it would work equally well on a, a, a wide frequency band or a wide frequency range. It would work equally well. It would just be very expensive to process. So we actually prefer to do sample rate conversion ourselves rather than let the, the code do it, because there are differences in sample rate converters, right? They produce slightly different results. Like if I use uh, something I've written by myself, I use the sample rate converter in FFmpeg, for example. If I use sample rate conversion that Apple provides in their own audio libraries, they're all, they all produce a result that's slightly different, right? So that's bad for purposes of making fingerprints. We want them to always do the same thing. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, the nodes change their fuzziness dynamically and, and independently. Do you track, monitor, and log this? And if so, how? Asynchronously or? Um, so yes. Yes and yes and yes. Um, I, I, I haven't talked about sort of logging or statistics collection. We do have our own statistics server that is specifically for matching. Um, and what we generate is, uh, as each match is performed and finished, we fire uh, a message, a zero MQ message, about sort of the ma that match process, that individual query, into a statistic server that collects it and logs it. So we know how many fuzzy, how many, how fuzzy it was when it did it, uh, how many searches per second. We have all these statistics that we look at. Um, so the answer is yes. Now they make the decision on their own if they think they're falling behind. Um, there's a th there's a, like a there, we use a fixed threshold that says if I fall five six I forget what it is five or six or ten qu queries behind start reducing my bit count until I get to a reasonable level and then I can turn it back up again. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, there was some research that came out this year uh, on a new FFT algorithm. Mm -hmm. Now I was wondering, I'm just curious if you had seen that and whether it would have any impact for you guys. I have not, and it might. Okay, yeah, the faster that it's for, it's optimized for sparse spectrum. I know, check it out from uh, MIT, I think. Okay, that's great. I will check that out. Yeah. Yes, sir. As you guys move to the clustering model, did you did you just kind of mimic what they're do what you would do in a high performance uh, computing environment, or did you guys actually go out and say buy Maui and Torque or like how did I'm sorry um, Moab and Torque, but rather, are you using commercial products to do your actual scheduling and resource management, or are you guys did you guys write your own thing? It's all we we wrote all of it. Um, it it's it, yeah. The, it, it, I, I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but. You answered it, just oh, kind yes. of understanding. We, we wrote it all uh, from, from scratch. Uh, it's actually not that much code. It's a very, very thin, small thing. It's, it's not a, a huge undertaking. The biggest deal is just communication between the nodes, heart beating to make sure services are up and not down from the, when the nodes come up and they have to go find the job router or the sync or the publisher. They need to know that they're still there. So it's built into this process that we can scale any part of it, right? So we can scale the... The, the CGI layer that takes JSON requests coming in, we can scale the nodes themselves that do the matching. We can actually scale the router in the sync if we want to. 
Um, we haven't had to so far because the throughput of queries is not past a gigabit per second. So we haven't had to go down that road, but we can. We can say, make another one, make another one, make another one, put them behind a DNS around Robin, and just let it fly. And it'll, all, it'll discover, currently, it'll already discover all the services and just use them all to spread the load out. So there's, there is actually no barrier to scaling this forever if you had enough dollars. Anyone else? Going once. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>